Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live Q&A with Michael Hampton. Um, before we start, I have to go over a couple points. Um, first off, for all those in attendance, make sure to start entering your questions now so that we can get the queue going and pretty much have the questions ready for Michael to answer. Also, uh, for those uh, who have more than one question, you can ask more than one question. Just make sure you know you give other people a chance to ask there as, as well. And please let us know if you have a microphone or not, so that way we can allow you to speak to him directly if you do. Um, but beyond that, I'm going to pass uh, control over to Michael. So Michael, uh, whenever you're ready, you can basically begin. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to um, watch the workshop. Uh, I hope that it was a little bit helpful for some of you guys. And um, I guess I owe you also a brief intro, uh, mainly due to the fact that I think that my background is pretty substantially different than some of the other people that may have presented uh, through this forum, in that it's not incredibly industry heavy. Um, my background may be similar in some of the education. I, I went to Art Center College of Design, which um, some of you may know as uh, concept design kind of focus or oriented school now. Uh, when I went, it was in more of a transitional period from what was editorial illustration at the time um, into kind of where it is now, the more concept design or um, concept heavy uh, classes or techniques. Uh, and I think that what that gave me that may be a little bit different is um, a much more kind of, um, not that this is any better or worse, but broad um, approach in that I had a lot of time in different departments. So it wasn't just um, an isolated illustration background. I spent a lot of time in the fine art department and in the academic department. Um, and so I did a little bit of freelance while I was in Art Center, but almost immediately after I went right into graduate school. Uh, where I went uh, was Claremont Graduate School. It's also in California, one of the older colleges in uh, private colleges in California area, Southern California. And um, there I studied fine arts um, and uh, painting with an emphasis on kind of theory and abstraction, which is um, something that I think that the figure uh, really helped me with, uh, the study of the figure, and also something historically that I see the figure um, setting up a lot of artists for. Um, and I do practice that now. Uh, I think my, my main role in industry as far as movie or animation is really an educational position. Um, and now, um, again, I love teaching in that it affords me a lot of time to continually educate myself. And now I'm um, doing another master's working towards a PhD in art history. Um, so that's really my, the short of my background. Uh, a couple years ago, I self-published the figure drawing uh, design and invention book. It was initially just uh, meant to be something to help my students in class. Um, so I did put up the leftovers on Amazon and have sold you know, a few of them uh, that way outside of uh, my students directly. Uh, but it was initially conceived of something that would be used in the classroom and would be paired with my lectures so that it would have the, uh, the reinforcement of what was said with the, the diagrams and the practical application. Um, and that is um, now on its third edition, and um, every time I make a new edition, I always make sure that I um, update stuff, update. I'm constantly learning, constantly unhappy with some of the things that are in there, um, so I try to make a, a point of always trying to improve it as there's um, a great deal of uh, imperfection in it still, so it's that kind of constant process of learning and self-correcting. But that's it. That's what I've got for an intro. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Michael. Um, our first question um, is from uh, Todd. He says, hello, Michael. Great lessons. Uh, do you have a fast shorthand for the figure to block them into your scenes at the right scale and shape while you're just getting the vibe of the scene so you don't lose the feeling with anatomy? Um, and can you show us what that might be? Thank you. Um, well, I would use exactly what I use in the demonstration anytime I'm trying to relate a figure to a scene. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm having some uh, Photoshop slash Wacom tablet problems or else I would do that. But one of the things really uh, important for me is composition. And that's something that I think is more interesting uh, as a subject and area of study than just the figure per se. I think of the figure more as just kind of a, a single vehicle that um, offers compositional 
problematics. Uh, and so one thing that I especially like about the, the gesture or the way that I work through the lay-in of the figure uh, is that it allows for integration into any type of thematic compositional setup. Um, and again, what I mean by that is the kind of emphasis on the abstract linear lay-in of the figure um, I think is something that really allows for a departure into uh, assimilation into a scene, uh, whether it be that you're extending those rhythms into um, composition lines that you have set up, um, or that the story and dynamic of the figure allows you to create a repetition of theme into existing compositional elements uh, and scene around it. Um, as far as scale goes, um, again, as I have noted in the lecture, I'm probably notorious for being a bad practitioner of proportions. Um, it's something that I kind of just, you know, out of all of my tools, I spent the least amount of time developing. And so for me, it's always just kind of sight and, and the feel of the scene and what would look correct. Um, but again, it's, it's really for me that, that abstract implication of the figure as it's laid in and how I can and use that as a departure point into a scene. Thank you, Michael. And Todd, I wasn't sure if you had a mic or not, so I apologize if you did. Um, if you have another question, I guess you can ask it, and I'm going to give you a chance to talk to him. Um, but if not, then it worked out perfectly fine. Um, our next qu question is from Chris. And Chris asks, uh, how do you approach your initial gesture when there is extreme twisting slash bending of the figure or extreme foreshortening? Uh, really the same way. I mean, for the gesture, I think you can still approach the figure in the exact same way. Um, I mean, it's really not that spatial specific as far as the way that the figure is understood. Uh, the gesture lines still are just enacting some type of rhythmic passageway through the form, be it standing or foreshortened. Um, but that being said, I always also employ multiple styles of drawing. Um, I don't think you should have just one approach to drawing. If I see uh, a pose that suggests uh, a level of difficulty or just a type of position that suggests a different approach, that's something that I would absolutely consider doing. Uh, if something is severely foreshortened, I may tend to take the approach that is um, more shape-to-shape -shape or a part-to-part -part method, which might require that I slow down a bit uh, and make more of a study of uh, where things are lining up. Uh, especially in foreshortened where the figure is thrown into a tremendous amount of abstraction. Uh, it just may be a better solution. Um, so the approach that I kind of went through is more uh, kind of the mechanics of invention, uh, but that being said, it should just be one tool in your belt or arsenal of ways to approach the figure. Awesome, Michael. Um, our next question is from Arthur. Uh, he says, hey, Michael, thanks for putting all together uh, your book. Um, any tips on how to render the figure after uh, tightening up all the proportion, anatomy, and muscle skeleton? Thanks in advance. Um, sure. Uh, the uh, rendering is also something that I think is um, maybe a, a different technique. Like, uh, like I said, um, the ability to have multiple approaches is going to really service all of you. Uh, and I think for rendering, it's just that thing. I do touch upon it a little bit in the back of the book, but it's you know, hardly serviced for the, the two or three pages that it gets. Um, I generally base my understanding of rendering on the form beneath. So I think you can't, you can't get away with uh, rendering something out without having that, that construction or that initial foundation built in. Uh, and then I'll approach it generally from the position of um, tonal mapping. Uh, one of the schools I attended before Art Center was Associates in Art, uh, and that was a pretty um, dominant method of drawing there, a kind of an old illustrator method of laying out the figure, separating it into lighter, dark patterns. Um, and that's something that I generally do do. Uh, when I have all my construction and forms set up, I do work down the figure um, from head to foot, uh, mapping out the different light and shadow shapes, uh, I work from the core shadow uh, as it's probably going to be the darkest place and easiest to see an area of transition or form turn. And from that core shadow, I develop four edges, um, which are timing the experience of the viewer's um, progress around that form. Uh, and I associate those four edges um, to either a sphere, cylinder, um, box, 
or a cast shadow edge, which would be just a hard straight line. So I'm always trying to relate my form to the edge, the way something's rendered. Um, but for kind of like a highly rendered, detailed, uh, finished drawing, I think it's just exactly the same. Uh, and it follows a process of working up or building through your, you know, your successive layers of gradation. And then we get into some new kind of fun problems of composition. Um, the uh, idea of edge fall off, uh, which also I think brings us to another kind of interesting issue of uh, what does it mean to make a render drawing? Are you, uh, what is your definition of representation? Is it to uh, enact a photographic idea of, of something seen? Or are you really trying to think about the way that um, our eye takes in information from a scene subject? Uh, so I think it's just another door that gets opened uh, when we start to think about rendering filled with a number of really wonderful complex questions that go beyond the level of technique. Okay, and Michael, do you have any like final rendered um, compositions, uh, like of just your your final renderings or anything like that? Uh, when I was in school, I did a lot of representational painting. Um, I don't think I have any of those around, um, but not so much. I generally am, um, as far as this work for the book and the lecture, been more interested in the study and the setup, um, as I think it's something that I was always interested in as a student, and um, I think is valuable for a lot of students in making or exposing that thought process which doesn't really get so much um, in the final render. Well, that, that looks good right now, actually. Um, let me see. But perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, our next question is from Muhammad. Um, he says, hi, Michael. I'm not sure if this was addressed in your workshops, as I've only gone through half of your videos so far. Um, his question is, how do you combine limbs to the torso, specifically the legs with the lower torso, pelvis, and lower abdomen? I'm um, having problems when it comes to drawing female, especially from the three-quarter view. Anyway, love the book. In fact, I got to know about uh, CGMW through your, your blog. Um, so that was his question. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, for um, connecting the limbs, I generally do start by working through um, the bones. And so making sure that, you know, in the, the second stage where I'm laying on the, the skeletal structure on top of the gesture, I'm kind of like if you're looking at the desktop, the one you see on the bottom left. Um, that's really how I start to think about the placement and relationship of the bones. Um, basically drawing like a shorthanded skeleton. And then after that, if you look at the top right, the more finished drawing where the cylinders are laid in uh, for that arm on the right side, uh, that's how I would connect after. Um, I always make sure that I have a, a degree of overlap between the cylinder and the shape for the torso, um, the cylinder of the arm, the shape for the torso or the cylinder of the leg and the shape for the pelvis. Um, and then from that point, it's, it's anatomy, um, which can, at a very beginning stage, can be dealt with by you know, pinches and stretches or the C and S curves that we talk about um, in the book. Uh, but anatomically, obviously, a much more complex problem, as I think that's the, the most difficult part of the figure is really understanding the transitions. Um, so what I do offer in the book is just that you can always um, begin to generalize with the C um, or S curves, as long as the connections read well uh, with the wrapping lines and the overlaps. And then after you set up those kind of primary shapes uh, or intersections prospectively, then I think it's much more appropriate to begin the study of anatomically what exactly makes those parts work. Um, for women, um, well, there's a lot of difference uh, or some difference in skeleton. Uh, for example, the angle uh, of the legs the angle of the, the arm, the elbow, the displacement, and um, not displacement, but the uh, replacement of the areas of fat and the collection of fat um, give you know, obvious shape and proportion differences. Um, so that's what I would start with, is um, really trying to go and start using the basic skeletal structure that we set up uh, and giving it modified um, designs. Uh, for example, the, the degree of the opening for the rib cage um, is different in women, uh, the angle of that thoracic arch. So once you have that basic kind of constructive skeleton down, then it's just about changing it up. Um, and I think that's a great thought process to also begin because it uh, will allow you then to depart into animals and then that will allow you to depart into creatures 
uh, or wherever else it, it is that you end up wanting to go. All right, perfect, Michael. Um, this also, the, the image on the desktop real quick, I think illustrates my the question on the composition of the figure. Um, like, for example, here, how the lines show different movements and directions. That's something that I'm really interested in for composition is, uh, again, that's kind of more of an illustration of that principle. Right. Okay, good. Uh, I have a question from Art S. Actually, it's a a lot more compliment, but uh, his, his question is, uh, Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for this workshop. I love your approach to figure drawing. I already ordered your book and hope to learn as much as I learned in your workshop. But what's the best way to learn anatomy without losing motivation and how to get started? Thank you. Mm. Well, thanks. I'm glad that the, the workshop was helpful. Um, how, to, how to learn anatomy without losing motivation. That, that's a hard one. Um, it's obviously not easy to study anatomy, and um, it's not, let's just be completely honest, it's maybe not the most exciting thing uh, to cover. Uh, like when I make all the students break open their anatomy books on the first day of class, no one cheers, and there's not you know, resounding shouts of enthusiasm from all over the room. Um, so it, it's definitely hard to keep yourself motivated. Um, what I did and what I found worked for me really well was um, I liked hearing it a lot. So I attended, you know, when I was studying figure drawing, I tried to make it like a job. So I would go to classes you know, 35, 40 hours a week for years. And what helped me was just hearing it, the repetition of hearing it, but also being able to be in an environment where I could practically exercise what I was hearing, you know, with breaks. You know, so that um, you know, most of the drawing classes I attended were you know, lecture and then you draw some, and then lecture and you draw some. And I felt that was a great way to not immediately kind of forget some of the information you learn. And having to incorporate that into a practice is and maybe just as difficult as understanding what's there or what it is you're seeing or what the anatomy is doing. Um, so that's something I would definitely recommend as a way to study anatomy if you can uh, that I think will also help you stay motivated because you'll be able to see improvement and what's more you know, motivational than seeing your work grow. Um, but beyond that, I always continue to learn. And so I still don't think my study is, of anatomy is done and I continue to take classes uh, to improve what it is that, that I know. So it, it's a constant thing. Uh, and I think when you start to just enjoy the, the process uh, of learning that um, you know, it'll, it'll be a lifetime pursuit, which I think is going to be really rewarding. Perfect. Uh, I think that answered Art's question. Um, our next question is from Autumn, who asks, are there any resources you recommend for muscle to bone reference? Lots of muscle group stuff slash skeletal stuff, but I've had a lot of trouble with point of connection and mechanics, e.g. effect of uh, the ona radius rotation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. My favorite anatomy book is probably the Elliot Goldfinger book. Um, I really like that one a lot. I've had that one probably the longest um, because it does a really good job of showing that insertion um, origin. Uh, it has a real specific, nice presentation of skeleton, skeleton with insertion origin, um, anatomical diagram that's more kind of rendered and then the actual photograph. So you can make a comparison and connection all the way through. And what he also does that I really value is he demonstrates the muscle as a simple shape or design, which is something, again, um, that if you have the, the figure drawing book that I put out, really indebted to. Um, so I think that that's been one that I've really enjoyed. But that being said, I, I try to get every book um, that I can uh, on anatomy. So I mean, I think Hogarth's books are great. Um, I never got a ton from them in that they always just seem too stylized, but I still like them. Um, Bridgman is great, maybe not perfect for insertion and connection, or origin and insertion, um, but anything you can find, I would pick up, and uh, the Roche book is obviously you know, one of the, the, the better ones as well, um, but again, I'm just one of those people that kind of believes in getting every single book, and then uh, from there, kind of collecting, and um, piecing together your own puzzle. But definitely for insertion and origin, get the, um, the Goldfinger book if you don't have it. Goldfinger? So can you repeat the name of the book and the author one more time for the participants? It's um, 
Goldfinger's um, Anatomy for the Artist, Elliot Goldfinger. And he also writes a great book on animal drawing, or I'm sorry, animal anatomy, which is you know, not as comprehensive in any one animal as it is on, on the figure. And I think on the cover, it's black and white, and it's a um, photograph of a uh, man's back. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to have that reference online for all those. Okay. Um, but if you can, if you can send a link to it if you can find it. That would oh, be sure. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Chris. Uh, uh, basically, Chris asks, since hands can be pretty expressive and also complex, any tips on how to simplify hands and feet, too, for that matter? Um, for simplifying hands, I think there's a lot of different ways you can use. Um, in the book, I try to show the same approach in primarily a gesture. Um, and with the hands, I tend to group the middle two to three fingers with the wrist, um, especially the middle two, like your middle finger and ring finger, uh, as they tend to work collectively. Um, as kind of like a hook form, you can always find a nice gestural expression. Um, and if we're talking about gesture, I'm thinking about, again, the C and the S curves, uh, a way to unite those two fingers and the wrist. Uh, you can always find a C or an S curve that gives you a nice, great rhythmic relationship into the lower, the lower arm. Uh, and then from that point, I'm, I'm thinking about the, you know, obviously the remaining fingers as um, additive gestures that can combine or kind of um, relate to what's already been done. Uh, the feet, I think, are, as far as gesture goes, a little bit simpler um, in that for the feet, I, I'm generally basing every position off of some variation of a triangle. Um, I choose the triangle because it lends itself nicely to a simplified design for the foot. Uh, it's one of the more solid weight-bearing shapes in art, and so lends itself as a design solution well to the figure. Um, and then we don't obviously have a great deal of expression in our foot for uh, the ways that the toes are being used. So you can, I generally talk about it as a sock shape. Like, you know, that's how I'll start the hand and the foot um, together, uh, is imagining kind of uh, more of that envelope idea, which is somewhat of a departure from the gesture of the figure. So a really good question. Um, but I tend to kind of group from the outside in, um, still not a contour, but not as inside as the, um, the gesture of the figure may be with some of those more disparate lines. All right, perfect, Michael. Um, our next question is from Victor. Victor asks, or says, uh, great book, Michael, especially the first half of the upper torso construction portion. My question is, from a concept development student point of view, is your method of body constructive an effective approach to creating simple shapes and structure? Uh, well, I, first of all, I'm not a concept artist, so I'm probably not the best person to and give you advice on what is the best approach used for developing you know, a drawing for a concept art. Um, what I think that this approach is effective for is giving you a, a really solid idea of um, how to present three-dimensional form uh, that can construct the figure. Uh, and what I think is valuable about that, especially if you learn that type of focused three-dimensional construction um, for perspective, is the um, the interchangeability that it allows for uh, is that I think it's maybe one of the better ways to draw to analyze and investigate what you're seeing instead of just passively reproducing um, what's seen. Uh, and I think, and what I imagine, is that what's valuable for the concept artist is the ability to knock out just about anything that um, you can come up with in your head or that someone like um, an art director is trying to get you to come up with. Um, so I think this approach to drawing really facilitates that uh, level of study. Um, and it's, again, it's a tool that I think will give you a great deal of knowledge in the representation of space and form through the figure, um, but also in beginning with a departure point that allow you to understand different forms through that same type of method, like, again, animals, uh, and then the successive combination of animal and figure into you know, any type of creature. The design of shape, um, absolutely. I mean, I think that to focus intently on anatomy as shape um, is something that's going to start to sensitize you to shape. And I think a really important equation of shape, which is something I see used quite a bit in concept design, uh, which is the um, relationship of form and function. 
that those two things seem to have an intimate link in some of the kind of the more um, well celebrated designs um, through whatever they elaborate elaborate on, be it archetype or shape psychology. Uh, and I think the human figure is one of the best places to really observe nature in those principles. Thank you, Michael. And I wanted to basically say that again, what he what Michael does demonstrate with his techniques are very applicable to, you know, at least the technical and fundamental aspects of concept uh, development. So uh, it's just it's a foundational uh, source of just great information and, and technique, and it's applicable in just all areas of that. So um, to Victor, I think uh, he answered it pretty good as well. And, and to carry further, I think you can pretty much use this as an amazing starting point going forward. Um, but anyway, moving along, our next question is from Grace Fong. Basically, Grace uh, says, I come from a very technical thinking background, so while memorizing muscles is easy for me, I have a hard time making things look natural. Um, I guess she wants to know what your advice is for that. Like, what um, exercises just, would you recommend to make figures more fluid? Well, I don't know. I think that's um, it's a big question. I think the obvious answer you know, would just be just draw a ton. Um, that there is a certain amount of um, dexterity and naturalism that will come to your drawings the more that you do it. And that isn't to answer the question with a cop-out, um, as I know a lot of people just say draw, draw all the time. Um, I don't think that's actually helpful to draw um, without any type of program or idea of what you're drawing. Um, or why you're drawing, I don't think really will lead to a profound sense of improvement um, in your work. Um, but I think that having posed that question, I think is a great place to start. Um, I think if you can, maybe some, sometimes one of the hardest things to do is identify for yourself what the problem areas are in your drawing. Um, so if you're aware of the fact that naturalism or fluidity uh, in a figure is something that you find to have um, shortcomings in in your work, then there's you know, great ways to begin to solve that issue. Um, I think the presentation I did in the workshop on gesture and kind of picking out some of those historical references um, are all artists that have been praised or celebrated for their naturalism. And one of the things that I try to demonstrate as being uh, central to all of their practices is that um, curve, is that really that their celebration and uh, insistence on the rhythmic relationship of curve um, the S curve, the C curve, and how they interchange in that dynamic asymmetry. Um, so historically, um, history, the history of art would offer that for you. Um, that's one solution to that, that feeling of naturalism. Um, but, you know, it could be any number of things, and um, it would maybe require for me to really look at some of your drawings to make a good, uh, more um, generous diagnosis of, of how I could help you out. Uh, but that's one place I would start. Okay, thank you, Michael, for that answer. Um, our next question is from Raphael. He says, hi, Michael. Thanks for the amazing workshop. I'm learning to draw and just ordered your book. Do you have any advice for a very beginner student that wants to master anatomy in the human form? Thanks a lot. Um, well, thanks. I'm glad the workshop was helpful. Uh, again, the thing that um, I would give as, as beginning advice is the stuff that's the least fun and the least um, appealing to do, probably because it doesn't really offer the uh, the most kind of sexy um, result, which is just the perspective exercises, like really training your hand to draw um, efficiently and consistently uh, ellipses of any shape and size, spheres, boxes, cylinders. Um, again, I did try to make a point of that in the workshop too, and that's that's where it's at. I think that's probably the you know, the most important thing, and it's always the failing point of um, the students that I have in classes is that that's just not something that is fundamentally understood, um, and more than just being understood, it's not something that can be practiced. Um, as we all know, it's it's one thing to understand something, and it's one thing to to implement it. Um, so. Draw all the time, but with a purpose. Um, always be very conscious of what you're drawing and why. And I would highly recommend that um, all of your time be spent, at least to begin, 
analyzing and breaking things down into simple geometric forms and parts. Okay, thank you, Michael. And again, to all our participants, I see you guys on there, quite a few of you who haven't asked any questions yet. Uh, please feel free to enter your questions in now. I have an offline question for you, Michael, from Lewis, who asks, um, is it difficult, he says it's difficult to find uh, models to pose for him, so any advice on what to do in the situation? Do you draw from life or just continue looking at photographs? Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's a hard thing for, for most all of us is that uh, models are sometimes hard to find and um, they're obviously expensive, um, so it's, it's difficult. But there's a lot of good resources, um, you know, like the characterdesigns.com has a huge image library of models. I always direct my students um, to that site for homework to do studies from photographs. Um, I think that uh, posemaniacs.com is a good website, especially for, you know, seeing um, anatomy, as all the figures are a um, number of different positions. They all exist uh, as 3D, so you can spin them, uh, and they're uh, without skin, so you can see the different um, anatomical parts. Um, that's a great website, another one I direct my students to quite a bit. Um, and I try to make it a good uh, rule of thumb that for the practice of figure drawing, that 50% of your work be done from um, you know, old masters, um, people in history that you have a great admiration or respect for, um, you know, like Rubens or uh, a lot of Baroque artists tend to make, you know, especially dynamic figures. So if that's something that interests you, it's always great to be studying um, how the figures have been designed and posed for any type of uh, emotive quality. Um, and then also the actual life study, where you can look at photographs that are you know, well lit, that show the body. Um, and then um, you could always torment your friends or family, uh, of course, clothed. and. Um, make them pose for you in you know different positions or use yourself as a reference you know get a mirror and uh, you know do what you can to you know, use yourself to work out any difficult positions um, or uh, anatomical issues that you may have thanks a lot michael um, our next question is from michael metcalf he says hi michael thanks for the workshop you mentioned during your workshop that much to your students anguish you have them practice perspective how do you have them practice it, or what things to study? Uh, well, I think that kind of goes back to the last question about the uh, the basic geometric forms. Is I think it may be the mindset of some students that I have that um, they'll come right in and they just want to start rendering, or they're going to be more contour based. So I think the anguish the uh, is breaking people out of certain habits. Um, I think that you know the style that I draw in has a lot of um, Southern California, I think history behind it. So maybe students that aren't as familiar with it, I think just it's hard. You know, it's difficult. There's a level of difficulty with it that I think is is frustrating. And it's hard to make yourself kind of break down what you have, especially when you're getting consistent, effective results that you know you are pleased with, uh, that you know, give rendered figures that everybody thinks you know is, is nice and you get compliments on. To then to go back and start drawing balls and cubes and weird figures made out of boxes is you know, in perception a step back in a sense. Um, and it is. I mean, it, it is retraining your, your eye or your hand to see something different, but it's always at the betterment of you know, something finished or a finished product later on. But it does go back to that idea of, of the basic perspective principles. Um, you know, many artists have said that you know, all that you need really for any scene or images you know, the three basic forms, like a sphere, box, and cylinder, or a cone. Um, and that's, to me, it's just the ABCs of, of art. And it's the anguish of all my students that I won't let them go without having that done. Okay, and Michael, I have a question. So in your opinion, what is the number one mistake students tend to make when approaching drawing the anatomy in general anyway? Um, I, I think it's just contour. Uh, and, and I don't think that, again, like I, I think I mentioned in the workshop, it's not, I'm not trying to demonize it, but I think that I had a, a very um, kind of opinionated teacher uh, at Art Center who would call us liars if we made contour drawings uh, of the figure without knowing what they were, or he would call us sophists. Um, and again, basically the, 
the idea of sophistry being the act of speaking without really understanding what it is you're saying. And I think that that's tantamount to some of the beginning problems with anatomy and contour drawing, in that to see a bump or to see a curve and to put it down, and it's in a sense, uh, and it's an extreme sense, um, somewhat, it's lying in that you don't know what it is. Um, it's, it's just what's seen, but not what's understood. Uh, and so I think to really understand what's there and to faithfully be able to recreate for your viewer that experience, it does require that perspective and formal investigation into the inside uh, before kind of settling on that outside, which I think is the goal. I mean, I think everybody would love to be making um, beautifully rhythmic contour linear drawings, even myself. Um, but I also find that I have to at times take a step back and study the parts before um, you know I really get happy with what I'm laying down. So hopefully that answers. Yes, thanks a lot, Michael. Um, our next question is, uh, Michael, um, wait one second. Is an offline question from Kathy. Um, on models that are overweight, I find it difficult to find landmarks. Any tips to cre uh, on uh, on doing that? Um, it's just it is more difficult. Absolutely, um, the measurements for the landmarks that are covered in um, in the book, and I think just maybe really briefly with the lecture, um, I'll use you know the the seven and a half to eight heads high figure. Um, we'll still be the same. I mean, there's not going to be any change in the displacement of the skeletal structure because of the fat on top. Um, so it's just a matter of maybe being a little bit more attentive to begin with in, in inventing a type of proportion. Um, but other than that, it's, um, it's, if it's not visible, then a different approach to the drawing can be taken. Um, you can you know, develop more um, shape or perspective relationships between perspective components um, or Obviously, the pinch and stretch idea might be a little bit more useful um, in that. Okay, thank you, Michael. We have another offline question. Um, I think it's from Mike. Um, he asks, which um, which of the uh, of the anatomy or the human form uh, is the most difficult to draw, or to, or which area is to draw? I'm sure that will always change for everybody, um, but I think the for me is still the most difficult is probably the um, the forearm. Uh, I think it's it just offers the most amount of movement, uh, variation in position, exchange of anatomical part and tendon, um, or the um, lower leg. Just because I think that there's so much to know there, uh, the distribution and um, assignment of tendon you know, through the ankle um, is one of the more difficult areas to understand, uh, and also those areas specifically because of um, the difficulty that comes along with actually drawing them and not making them look like you know the lower leg or, or your forearm has exploded and all these bumps exist. Um, so I find that those areas offer the most complex problem because of not only the delicacy involved in really understanding what's going on, but the uh, facility that is required in actually drawing those areas out. But um, that being said, it, it changes for, um, you know, another, it could easily be said that uh, the head is the most difficult because there's so much uh, attention given to that area by the viewer, the head and the hands, uh, and the difficulty in, in creating likeness, which is something that I still you know, try to study and struggle with to this day. Um, so it's, it's all hard to me, but all challengingly and um, excitingly difficult. Okay. Um, our next question is a pretty interesting one. It's from Mohammed again. He asks, I'm not sure if you're involved in the upcoming master classes in the figure drawing on CGMW. Um, if you are, could you talk about how you would approach teaching figure drawing online? What would you cover in that course? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I am doing it or not. I not, just haven't really talked about it that much. Um, but uh, I can tell you how I structure my classes. Uh, again, I'm really concerned in my classes with um, students being able to perform the information. 
Um, so I think that for figure drawing classes, um, and I guess and I don't think that there's for me um, a difference between um, the online and then the the actual or physical classroom. Um, I think that the methodology is still the same, and that uh, again, it's it's great if you have a huge amount of technical knowledge, but if you don't have a way to and formulate that and put it down and make it uh, work for you and for a viewer, then I think it, it kind of becomes um, stilted. So uh, that's one thing I, I always try to make sure that the two halves uh, really resonate for the student, the technical uh, and the, the, the knowledge side or the information base. Uh, for teaching online, um, that's something that I also make sure that I try to um, show. It, I think or I did my best to try to present the workshop that way. Um, in giving you uh, or giving uh, the viewer the, the drawn and then the reasoned explanation because um, I think that that's something that's really, really valuable. Um, I think I see a lot of you know, concept artists and designers that it's always like the same 12 historical references. You know, there's like the sergeant then there's you know, the same, same, same. And it's, it never changes. So one thing that I always try to do for my students is um, online or physical in space classroom is make sure that they have a really broadened, wealthy background of um, experience and reference and knowledge to bring to their drawing, um, anatomy and historical, and then also that they have the fundamental skills that I think are necessary for starting out. Um, and I try to make it objective. You know, I don't, I really don't try to push a style. I try to really take stuff that I think is um, kind of general, agreed upon, um, base level competency and work that I see and give it as a foundation. Um, and I try to also make this clear in the book that and I think it's enough of a foundation for stylistic exploration and personalization to take place on top of or with. Um, and I think that as a core philosophy that that would be something that I would make sure came through in either online or um, I know I practice that in class. Okay, thanks for that, Michael. And again, everyone, um, please check back on our site for any future updates concerning the master classes. Where we'll be posting um, the, the future roster as far as instructors and classes and everything related to that. Um, our next question is from Miguel. Um, he says it's a two-part question. First, he asks, how important are figure drawing classes in general, and what do you recommend doing in class students can't, for students who can't attend those? How important are figure drawing classes? Um, yes. For me, uh, I think I think that'll just depend. I mean, I don't. I think it will depend on what your interests are. Um, I would never generalize and say that you know, oh, without a figure drawing class, that you know, that that's it. You know, you just you should hang it up because uh, I just don't think that that's true. Um, I think it's really helpful for some people. Um, for me, it's just what I gravitated to as a student. Um, you know, I, I really just enjoyed it. It was all from the first time I sat down, you know, one of the most you know, complex and also frustrating um, things I'd ever done, and it just really drew me in. Um, but I think that it's just important to be attentive to, um, you know, what your interests and where they lead you uh, to make sure that your studies go you know, in a positive kind of inspired way. Um, but that being said, I think that you can build the same foundation level of skills doing anything. Uh, as long as you're you're conscious and you know, intelligent about what it is you're trying to develop uh, artistically, why, and you know, do your research on some of the best ways that other people are developing those same skill sets. Um, if you don't have access to a figure drawing uh, classroom or environment, um, again, I don't I don't think that that's you know, the worst thing ever. I mean, you can also just develop those same skills, like I said, in any number of ways. Um, I think that maybe there's just a lot of tradition. Uh, that people you know, like about having the figure drawing classes. Did that answer both parts? I believe so. Um, okay. And he he says, yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, our next question, he says, thanks a lot. Um, our uh, next question is from Todd. Todd asks, uh, or more, more of a request actually, could you list a few of the not so well uh, well, he says, could you list a few not so well known great artists to check out? Oh, um, I get to you a ton. It doesn't anything in particular. Uh, I don't want to list you weird abstract artists that you would you want to punch me in the head for recommending to you. 
So Todd, if you heard that, uh, please give us a specific uh, category or such that you would want him to give some names to. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, another question basically asking what are your, or who are your greatest mentors? Um, um, it always changes, and I think that it's good to change. I don't, what I was never attracted to uh, as a student is, um, is that reverent, um, you know, really like endearing, um, you know, one student to one teacher um, mentorship. Um, that's something I always thought was kind of weird, and, um, and I, I didn't, I mean, it has a weird kind of disciple uh, quality to it, and I never really thought that the students that practiced that kind of religious devotion to one teacher or style is really was really ever that interesting. So I'm kind of irreverent in that sense. Um, you know, as I went through school, I had I tr I tried to study with every person in Southern California that I thought you know was interesting. Um, so you know, earliest teacher that I you know I continued to come back to, whether it was in classes or literature, was um, Glenn Vilpu, a great teacher um, and very generous. And by that I mean that. He's very articulate. His ideas are very um, open. Uh, he doesn't, you know, make it any type of mystery as to what he's doing. And that's something I always appreciated was that, you know, objective transfer and presentation of information. Um, but it's not limited to me for, you know, people I had access to. I also just was really ravenous uh, and interested in historical people. And I would really get, like, immersed in an artist and get all the books that I could on any one and then read them all and then I would you know lose interest and then it would be time for the next one and then I think doing that would really bring out a lot of um, you know, questions for you as an artist and also allow you to you know, really build a, you know, a deep complex relationship with the tradition of art and art history so I mean Cezanne, Gerhard Richter, Rubens you know there's just no I don't have any one specific period in time that I you know, like I don't just like pre-Raphaelite art or just don't like, you know, British portraiture. Like I try to not just be in a specific historical period because uh, I think you can get stale doing that. And the same thing with teachers. Like I don't think that you should have you know, one type of teacher that you only listen to. Um, I think that the best kind of artistic results come from that really um, more um, schizophrenic relationship to information and, and source. Wow, thank you, Michael. Um, our next question is from, I believe, well, actually, uh, Todd followed up with a response. He, in relationship to his uh, question about, can you list uh, a few of the not so well known great artists to check out? He says something to help the figure. I suppose since that's, uh, you know, something related to, I guess. Figure drawing. Oh, that's what we're checking out. Maybe a couple Orientalist artists. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't. I don't have a huge background. Um, definitely not one you know, developed enough to give you obscure um, Orientalist artists. Um, most of my you know study has been more Western, um, and for you know different figure um, specifically, um, I like a lot of contemporary painting. So like. Uh, for people that are interested in the figure and what people are doing with it today, which I think is really important because, again, going back to the idea of history, you don't want to just get like locked in to what Sargent was doing with figures because, I mean, how difficult is that really to relate to or, you know, Rubens in, in contemporary times? Um, so I think it's, I always make sure to tell my students that you know, the figure is something that, again, it's a vehicle um, and you should be looking at all periods. So today, um, look at John Curran, look at Jenny Seville, um, Look at Daniel Richter, look at Gerhard Richter, um, and I think that's more like in the fine art um, or you know figurative painting um, side of things. Uh, and what I appreciate about a lot of those artists is their ability to distort and change and warp the figure for um, their ideas to to suit their ideas. And so that might be a great list or collection of artist names to also let you know that you know my interest isn't to be kind of machine-like in my presentation and drawing of anatomy and, and structure and perspective and all those different things that I, I really do honestly believe in that as a departure point into the figure as a, as a vehicle for the presentation of your, your thoughts and ideas. Um, 
you know, other than that, I think I would only really be able to pull out, um, you know, the more kind of known ones. Um, but um, Thomas Eakins is good going back in history. Um, if you, if anybody does like Sargent, he was highly dependent on British portraiture and tradition. So Sir Joshua Reynolds, Gainsborough, um, a lot of those artists for, you know, especially painting. Um, and that's generally what I'm thinking in terms of this uh, painting. Uh, for people that are drawing the figure, um, a living artist, again, Jerome Witkin is probably my favorite living figurative artist. Uh, I think the drawings and the figurative compositions that he comes up with, especially for some of their social and political uh, relevance or idea behind them are just phenomenal. Um, so, but I think a, a great way to, to kind of follow up on that is just go to as many museums as possible. Uh, I think that's the best way to discover stuff. If somebody catches your eye, um, you know, get the get a book, do research, and just follow them. Uh, that's what I'd always do: is follow their not not what they're doing presently, but what led to them. Um, you know, you can always trace the artists I and mean, the genealogy of their their interest and practice. You know, back through history infinitely. So hopefully that gives you a few. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, we actually have an interesting question from Maloney, um, or Malone. Uh, do you have a microphone, by the way, Malone? Um, if you can hear me, I'm going to basically activate your mic. So, hello, Malone? Malone, are you there? Okay, I don't know if he has a mic, but... I I'm going to ask the question on his behalf, and please excuse me, my Latin is not that good. So, um, basically he asks, how would you box up the upper and lower torso and the rear? Can a single muscle ever be shown both squashing and stretching? And please explain the latissimus dorsi and the teres major interaction and connection to the arm. Thanks. Um, okay, well, let me start. For boxing out the, the rib cage and the pelvis, uh, from the back, I use the the landmarks um, for the back of the rib cage. Um, the the end or the uh, the bottom two ribs generally will present a similar shape to the front in that it's uh, much like the peace sign and the egg that I talked about in the lecture. Um, but that peace sign or that triangle at the bottom will be much more um, collapsed. Um, I use those two points as the back plane proper. Uh, the two points that would give me a surface that define the back, um, the corner or the border of one of those points would give the side plane, and I'll take the height of that to roughly about the point of the top of the scapula, uh, and that's where the height of the box will exist. The big difference for the back of the rib cage will be that as a box you'll see on top of it, um, whereas from the front you'll see underneath it, and that's to set up a logical recording of the perspective travels of the spine. The pelvis from the back, I'll use the sacrum, uh, that triangle that doesn't really get covered efficiently in the lecture because of time, uh, and we only did the front. But I'll use the sacrum uh, as the landmark point and extend the plane or the points of landmark just a little bit beyond it to set up the back. Uh, and then from that point, you'll get the side. And then I always make sure that from the pelvis, uh, from the back view of the pelvis, um, I'll show underneath that perspective as it has to be the complement to what's in the front, which is the top view of the box uh, of the pelvis from the front. So that's a, that was the first part. What was the second part of the question? Well, the second part of the question was, uh, can a single muscle ever be shown both squash, squashing and stretching? Nothing. Can a single uh, muscle ever be shown? I, I, um, I would imagine, I, it's hard to think of an example. Maybe, um, maybe your tensor fascia on the leg if you are bending your leg, um, but your muscle, but your leg is abducted, I guess technically it could be squashed and pinched at the same time. Um, but that would, I think, what would have to be required is a competing um, eminence, like the you know the leg pushing up against the iliac crest, causing for the muscle to to pinch while it's possibly stretched. Um, but can you ever have a muscle that's stretched and pinched at the same time? Um, I would say no, although there's degrees of stretch and pinch. Okay, and the last part was, uh, please explain the latissimus dorsi and teres major interaction and connection to the arm, which I think you probably uh, covered. Yeah, 
Um, that's just going to take, I would get out an anatomy book and really go through the connections. Um, the latissimus is you know, that really important adductor uh, of the arm on the back, which is uh, covering a lot of the, the information anatomically on the back and then going to the, the humerus. And then the teres major, uh, that really important hero muscle of the scapula that I commonly, commonly see people leave out all the time. Um, so that larger shape moving from the scapula to the humerus, uh, really complex interaction. And I feel more comfortable actually using images to, to define and, and really do a, a good job. Otherwise, I think I would just be you know, misleading and confusing. Okay. So I'm going to have to defer to a later anatomy lecture. No problem. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question is from Marco. Marco, do you have a microphone by any chance? Uh, you didn't give me a response. Uh, so if you're there, I'm going to activate your your mic. Hello, Marco. Marco, are you there? Okay, I'm assuming he doesn't. So I'll just read what he, he wrote. He says, hi, Michael. Great workshop and book. Both have been very helpful. Uh, my question is, when drawing from life, is it important to draw details like wrinkles, hair, etc., or should you just stick to drawing a structure? Um, I, I would say they're both important, but I would never move to the particular before really working out the general. Um, and I think that the only danger in moving to the wrinkles and the, um, you know, the features and the hair right off the bat is that it, when you're prioritizing your drawing, which is really you know, your thought process, it doesn't allow enough um, to be understood to service it and support it. Um, it'd be like if I you know, wrote a paper or gave a presentation and didn't talk about what my main you know, interests were and just started to give you facts and details. Um, so you know, always I think about it in comparison to language or writing or, or speaking. Um, so, of course, they're absolutely important. It's part of the thing that gives us, you know, a lot of, of life and expressive quality to the figures um, in what I would imagine is a harder thing to relate to being the structure is it's just not something that we relate to and see uh, like boxes and cylinders. I mean, it's abstract. It's highly abstract. Um, and that's one of the things I always try to emphasize in, in my students' work is that it's actually a very abstract process to draw representationally. Um, and I think that you know, abstract art is probably much more representational than we give it credit for. Um, so I think that absolutely important, but it has its place and it should be, you know, depending on where you're at with your drawing, it may be subordinate to larger issues at this time. Okay, and I think actually we've reached our, uh, our end point. Um, for this particular live Q&A. So I'd like to thank everyone who attended today's live Q&A with Michael Hampton. And a special thanks to Michael for giving us a, a portion of his time today to answer our questions um, in this live Q&A. So Michael, thank you so much for participating and, and helping us out with this. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me and for everybody that, you know, that took the workshop. I want to thank you all for um, checking it out. Awesome. And again, to everyone, thank you for attending. For those of you who haven't checked the other workshops out, we still have uh, uh, other ones online that you can, you can buy and, 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 and look at as well. Um, so please check out the site also and look for this live Q&A to be uploaded sometime this week. Um, we also have uh, an issue with Peter's live Q&A for those of you who are still waiting for that. We're trying to resolve what was going on with the actual file, but we're trying to get it up as soon as possible. Um, beyond that, uh, this one should be up this week as well. Um, and again, thank you all for attending, and this concludes today's live Q&A. Thank you very much. Bye.